Oh yes, oh yes, oh yes, oh yes, guys. Welcome back. Second episode of the year. It's March. Um, yo, guys. The country is going through the most, eh? Yo, going through the most. Um, but that doesn't mean that we should slow down. It just means we should push even more. Welcome back to the channel. This is the show that looks at sustainable uh, production in your crop farming enterprise. We also look at how we can maximize returns because at the end of the day, we're running a business. So guys, if you've been following the video series so far, you'll know that uh, this talk today will be talking about planning. So today I'll be talking to you guys about uh, the current climate of agriculture in the country. And then we'll get into the planning aspects of, uh, you know, basic education and training, market research, uh, budgeting, land prep, all the way to soil sampling. So if you've read the book, then I'm taking that big chunk of that first chapter. And uh, yeah, let's get into it. So talking about the climate of agriculture I'm just you know painting a picture for someone who's not in agriculture or for those that are maybe not aware it's just a few statistics that I'll hopefully put up somewhere so when we're looking at commercial agriculture less than 10% belongs to African uh, 90% is white owned commercial agriculture commercial agriculture uh, it's more of a turnover if you're making more than a million rand a year uh, as opposed to the size age of area that you're in. So it's more about turnover, the amount of money coming in. So, yeah, our people are not there. When it comes to small-scale um, agriculture, mostly uh, African farmers there. Uh, and uh, as much as there's more small-scale farmers than commercial farmers, the output is more coming from commercial farmers. Last I checked, 80% of our produce came from the commercial side, while only 20% comes from the small-scale side. So, I mean, I'm trying to help uh, the growers, us, to improve the 20%. You know, let's at least get it to 50%. Let's, just le- let's, let's at least provide half of the country's needs. So, yeah, that's where I'm coming from. I'll put in some links on documentations for those who are interested. That will give you a more rounded idea of the picture. Um, I'm talking about the advisory panel on land reform, their recommendations. That was a good um, document. I'll also put in a link for the land expropriation bill, which also had you know some worthwhile inputs um, from government. So let's get into planning. When it comes to, when it comes to planning, there's 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 uh, questions that you should be asking yourself as a farmer. These are the type of questions that help you to get an understanding of the type of enterprise that you want to get yourself in. It makes you understand where the key role the key role players are that you will need in order to effectively produce. For example, if you know that you're going to need seedlings, without a doubt, then having a nursery that's a town away 100 kilometers away is not uh, feasible might not be feasible for you so these are some of the things that you need to think of before you even get into production so in that regard the most important question that you should be asking yourself is why am i farming Um, if you know that you are farming for profits then you're on the right channel you need to do what needs to be done by any business owner if you know that you're farming for subsistence, then your approach changes. It becomes one that is more uh, cost effective, super cost effective, and it's more for making enough for this season and having some for next season. While if you're growing for business, it's completely dependent on what the market tells you it wants. And also with that uh, foresight of growing enough for this season and having a bit to to carry on for next season uh you you don't want to find yourself in a position where the field is clean and there's no next stage that's coming up you know 
but we'll talk more about that as we get into production. The biggest question I get a lot is tabs, what should I grow in my area? And it's a very loaded question because what you can grow in your area depends on many factors. It's not just grow this at this time. It's all those things into one um, that gives you an answer as a farmer to say, okay, let me go into this. And we usually say you do all of this way before planting so that it gives an idea of how the year goes in terms of having a production cycle. How will you stagger your activities? How will you also pay your workers? Because they'll be paid based on activities. So very important to get this done as soon as you can. Now the important part is basic education and training. I did mention that if you're gonna go into a specific crop, you want to at least know that you've got the expertise. If you don't have the expertise, at least someone close to you in your team has those expertise to ensure that the company or the business does well. So, I mean, in that regard, we need to know about the soil. We need to know about this crop that we're planting. We need to know about the markets. There are, there are aspects that we really need to know about. So we need to know what this crop needs in terms of nutrition. What are the major pests so we know what to look out for, to budget for those things as well. We need to know these things. Because if you don't know these things, someone will come, they'll tell you that they know, and they'll make you pay for that knowledge. If you're going to be growing outside, you might want to look at things like um, finding out about soil triangle because you need to know the type of soil you have, the texture, uh, the, um, whether it's sandy or loamy or clay soil. Usually you want loamy soil. Um, clay is very important in the soil. I'll touch on it when we get to production. But uh, having clay in the soil is very important and organic matter. So we, we need to look at all those things. We, if we're growing in tunnels, you need to know where exactly are you going to put these tunnels. Can you get the right orientation of north to south to ensure that when the sun rises from the east and sets in the west, there's no issues of shading that are shading your, your, your crops. You need to look at all these things. Very important section is market research, probably one of the most important sections uh, one would have in any business. Uh, because if you're not growing for people who want to buy what you have, then what are you doing? Who are you doing it for? So very important that the grower spends time on market research. A lot of guys start out with cabbages because it's, it's, it's fairly easy to grow cabbages. At the same time, cabbages don't require uh, that much negotiation when you get to the market. It's a product that's readily needed. It's high in vitamin C. It's uh, carbohydrates. It's, you have families whereby maize meal and cabbage is a meal. So it's, it's just, uh, it's a common vegetable um, that doesn't require a lot of fuss and budgeting from the grower. So that's why farmers like to go for it. But now if you're going to go for a produce like this, know where you're going to send it. Whether it's fresh produce market or retail stores or directly to the cu customer or agro-processing, um, franchises, mills, that type of thing. Know where you're going to send it. We have something called value chain analysis for crops. That's just saying the different avenues that any crop can go through. Uh, I've mentioned cabbages, but you might have a crop like sunflower, whereby the actual seeds can be sold as pet food or can be sold as nutraceutical food. Or the seeds can be crushed and oil can be extracted and can be sold as cooking oil, sunflower oil. The actual plant can be sold for aesthetic reasons, you know, as a sunflower. So those are different uh, value chain outcomes that, are, that sunflower crop can have. So it's important that you know where you fit in with the crop that you're producing and where you want to take it because that all have implications on the management style and that, it, that has implications on how much you spend on the crop. So do that 
way before you start planting. You are able to budget, to budget by doing that. You are able to know exactly the resources that you will need, the key resources that you'll need in order to make the business a success. I touched a bit on it, but marketing mix is very important. Do not have on your one location for your crop. Uh, you need to minimize the chance of risk. You need to minimize the chances of someone saying, no, sorry, I can't take it, or no, this is the price you're gonna get, take it or leave it. We need to start taking agriculture as a business. It's, that's what it is. It, it long ended as a hobby. If you take it outside of subsistence farming, then it's not a hobby anymore, it becomes business. And so we need to treat it as such. We, we give it the respect that it deserves because at the end of the day, we're trying to create something that will provide a remuneration, financial independence for us, as well as we're creating something for long term, a legacy, I imagine something that you can live on and leave behind for a kid. And now, of course, when you've done all these things, you're able to have like a list of things that you need and you're able to start, you know, the, the beginnings of a quotation to say, okay, I maybe need 10,000 Rand to do this, I believe. So in that way, you're able now to say, if there's some sort of funding available, I've got a figure to say, okay, this is how much I'll need for my business. But, um, it's, it's important to know a quick word about funding is depending on who is providing the funding, there are certain things that they're looking for. And these things usually revolve around documentation, revolve around the business plan, specifically your financial uh, section of that business plan. So it's important that from the beginning of you having this idea of I want to start this business, document everything, do record keeping. It makes it easier for anyone who wants to assist you to come in and work with the information or the data that you have. But if you keep everything in your head and you don't put it into documents that can be shared with other people, you sort of alienate yourself to not being able to be assisted because you're not speaking the language of business that everyone else out there is speaking. So the more you start doing it from the beginning, the easier it is you form the habit of doing things in a business way. And um, just a quick word, when I did work in that one NGO, whereby we were working in rural uh, communities with uh, communal farmers, one of the things we would do is we would, uh, teach them about different different saving techniques and investment techniques so that they could have their own savings group as farmers and they could loan each other to ensure that production continues. But because they were in rural-based communities, we went above just having enough for having enough money for production. It was money that was used for livelihoods. Families were buying fridges and yeah, the chest freezers, you know, things that they wouldn't get in the situation if they were alone. So this now I'm taking it to saving groups and buying groups. If you are growers in a specific area, we need to start this uh, mentality of having growers coming together, putting, pooling money together and buying whatever stock or inputs that they need at discounted rates. I'm pretty sure you guys know this. When we put money together and we buy whatever stock or produce, if it's at a high enough threshold for whoever we're buying it from, the supplier, we qualify for discounts. There's savings when you come and we buy in numbers. It's done on a large scale by rural farmers or rural-based farmers who, who know it or are taught it. It's also done by commercial farmers who choose to be in buying groups, but there's a large section of, let's say big, small scale farmers, African farmers who don't do it because of a lack of trust. So it's something that we need to start, especially if you're a young farmer, get into it. Yes, it's built, relationships are built at the speed of trust, but if we don't start doing it, we will get left behind because there's no big banks that are running to fund us. Okay guys, I swear I'm wrapping it up. Um, 
I know you guys, like, you don't want to hear about farming for a long time. Might mess your brain up. So just last few uh, points, land preparation and soil sampling. So land preparation, this is when now you've done everything in terms of desktop research, going to the market, going to your neighbors, finding out how this is done, what you need to do with this, getting all that information. Now we go, we've got land, or we're using our backyard garden or whatever we have, or we're gonna, you know, whatever, got it from the government, whatever. We're not sure if it's, it, it's the right type of land. How do I know if it's the right type of land? There are certain steps that one can take. I've detailed them in the book, but I'll just touch a bit on it. We've talked about the first step, which is a commodity assessment. You need to know everything in terms of value chain about this uh, crop that you're going to put down. You need to know about the various risks that you could be getting into. You need to know what production system you'll use, because that also has cost implications. You need to know the lay of that land, be able to look at various aspects of that land that will tell you, okay, I can produce here or no. I will need to first fix that in order to produce. Certain things like topography, looking at the drainage, how uh, pathways, waterways go. Maybe there's areas where you might need to grade and level roads. These are all very important things that need to be done before you get started because they will have implications on your access into the farm as well as your produce getting out so you don't want to be caught out on farm security you want to make sure that you are not right there next to the community if you're having a big operation if you are next to the community and also uh, next to livestock you want to make sure that your boundary protects your produce because at the end of the day you're going to be investing in that small piece of land so you do everything to make sure that nothing no pest no disease no animal no person can disturb your process and when it comes to soil sampling basically how do you know if you how much fertilizer or what fertilizer to use the only answer to that is by doing a soil sample soil sample tells you what's in the soil um, it tells you what you need to put into the soil for your crop to grow effectively. So if you don't do a soil sample and you just put in fertilizer, chances are because of whatever soil chemical interactions in the soil, you might be wasting that fertilizer because it, it might not be able, it might not be taken up by the roots. For example, if you have too high or too low pH in the soil, the fertilizer changes into a chemical formula that the roots cannot assimilate, cannot pull out. So by correcting it, by adding lime, we neutralize that acidity and bring the, the um, pH to the right level if the pH was too low. By doing a soil sample you, you might be spending a few hundred bucks but those few hundred bucks will save you thousands of rands. So we usually say to the farmers to do it every two or three years just so you know what's going on in the soil. Uh, so the way in which you do it, I mean you can find it out online but you just basically go around the field in a structured manner Put that in a box that goes to the lab. The lab has all your information. When it comes back, they'll give you a report and that's what the agronomist will interpret for you to say, okay, from this, it says you need X amount of bags of this to provide that nutrient and this nutrient. So very important to do this. If you don't do this, basically farmers who don't do this, they run the risk of having low quality produce. How do you see low quality produce as a consumer? That's a produce that's not making it. That's a produce that's having short shelf life, dying, having spots, not looking too good, the whole consignment. So the farmers who obviously win in market are the ones with produce that last long and they're able to build better relationships with the distributors, which are the retail stores or the market agents. So 
very important this uh, this quality aspect yeah guys we've covered a lot but to be honest touching the surface man just touching the surface but uh this is where i'll end it i don't want to talk too long just a reminder i've got an ebook out called nazog basic guide to growing crops this is a toolkit that will assist you into growing crops from planting stage all the way up to post harvest compliance everything in between with during this video series i'm just taking you through sections of the book just touching on it but if you want the full details they're in the book i'll make sure to put the link in the description um yeah we've come to the end of the show next time we'll talk about production production and protection what that means how you want to structure your production in a way that there's always something going on for yourself and for your workers the land is always providing uh yeah so we'll talk about that stay awesome guys and let's keep working hard to feed the nation peace